Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? More excitement, please. Come on. <laughs> Woo! That's it. So I'm Martin Beebe. I'm from the UK. Is there anyone from England here today? Get the hell in. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the F12 developer tools. How many people have used F12 developer tools? A lot. Right. How many people have used Firebug? A lot. Well, actually, that looked like the less. Is that really true? Fair enough. Um, so many of you have already used them, but for those that haven't, they're in, um, they're in the built into the browser, and you just can go press F12 and they start up, or you can um, go into the tool menu and uh, pick them up from there. When they load up, they load up at the bottom of the screen, but you can unpin them and put them side by side with the browser if you want. So the basic sort of things that it can do, we can select any element on the page. We can uh, navigate through the HTML, have a look, inspect the HTML. Um, you can make edits to your page. And one of the things which is quite cool about the IE9 tools is that you can save those edits as well, because that was something which you couldn't do. You could make all the changes you wanted, but you couldn't make the, the edits. You couldn't save the edits, sorry. So, and probably the, the best feature and the feature which most people use is you can switch uh, rendering engines. You can switch the browser from IE9 to IE8 to IE7 so that you can just see how things lay out and how things work. So with that, I'll just quickly go through to my other machine. There we go. So this is the... Uh, this is the developer tools. You can unpin them here, or you just press this button here uh, to repin them at the bottom of the screen. I prefer to have them pinned, personally. And this little arrow here, we can run around the screen and we can select any element that we want. So we're going to go over to, say, somewhere like BBC News. Okay, if we select this one here, we can put something in, and we can see it just goes into the HTML there on the bottom, and we can go into that text, we can click it, and we can change it. So, like that. And then we can select another element on the page, say, we just click away. Excuse my uh, typing. Pop over onto the image. We can change any of the elements of the image, but we'll go and have a look at the, uh, God, it's a long alt tag, right? The source here. And we'll put something like HTTP. So you can kind of play around with HTML a little bit, and that's one of the things I really like about web developer tools. When I first started when I was about 16, I had to view source on the page and, and inspect stuff. I remember looking to learn from those pages and sort of clicking view source and looking at a table, and it blowing my mind how that actually worked. I had no idea how a table worked. And the only way that I figured it all out was just by looking and exploring and looking at other people's code and stealing other people's code and copying other people's code. And gradually, I got better and better and better. This developer tool set kind of gives you the ability to go even further. And we can do some awesome things to really understand how some of these more complicated browsers work. So one of the problems that um, a lot of people have when they come to developer tools, and one of the reasons they use it, is to try and figure out why their sites are broken. So if we just go to a site which uh, has a problem with IE9. If we go to Pizza Hut. You'll see down here that the document mode is IE8 standards mode. And they've done that. They forced it with, uh, with a little meta tag there to say that emulate IE8. Problem being that Pizza Hut, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to work with IE9. So we'll have a look at why that might be. So if I just switch to document mode into Internet Explorer 9, in fact, we're just going to have a look quickly how it should work. So in IE8, if we click Start Your Next Order, this little thing pops up so we can make a... a 
start our order, basically. You have a delivery or carry out. In England, we call a carry out when you have alcohol. It's not the same thing, I don't think. So we switch it into IE9 mode, and we click on uh, start your order here. Nothing happens. We've got like a totally black screen. Nothing popped up there. So that really interrupted their whole delivery process, the whole payment process. So you, you could probably think, well, IE9's at fault here, right? But the thing is, lots of things have changed between IE8 and IE9. IE9's become a much more standards compliant browser. And actually what a lot of developers have done in the past is hack around problems with IE7 and IE8 rendering so that it works across different browsers. You know, I've been up so many hours into the early morning trying to fix those sorts of incompatibility bugs. And they do it by browser sniffing. But if you do a browser sniffing where you just say, if IE, then do this hack, it causes problems for IE9, which is more standards-based. So if, for example, we go into the tools here and we change the user agent string to Google Chrome, so now the browser thinks that we are, uh, we are Google Chrome. And we click Start Order. It works. It's not that IE9 is broken, necessarily there. It's just that the if statement or the CSS statement which has caused that error is targeting IE, it's browser sniffing. So whenever you've got a problem in your site and you think it might be a problem with IE9, just check to make sure that it isn't by switching the agent string to something like Google and convincing those browser sniffers that you're a different browser. So let's go back to... Uh, Bing. So JavaScript is another really cool thing. It's really difficult when you're developing. How many people use Visual Studio to develop? I've used the JavaScript thing in there to, to uh, yeah. It's really good. I mean, that's the way I generally do a lot of JavaScript development is actually in Visual Studio. But sometimes, you know, you can't always have Visual Studio or you might only have a browser or it might not be your site. You might not have the code. So what we can do is we can just set up a debugger. Uh, we can have a look and put breakpoints in there, explore the code a little bit. We can unminimize minimized code. We can uh, hover over values and have a look and peek into things. We can have locals and watches and all the sorts of things you'd expect from, a debug, from debugging your browser. So we will just go on to Bing Maps here. And right, if I just check into the script section here. And I'll click onto this JS. This has been a minimized piece of uh, JavaScript, right? So sorry about that. I'm used to doing this much low tech. I prefer it that way. Right. So if we go and switch over, sorry, all I did was switch from the HTML over to the script tag there, and we right click here, and we can insert breakpoints, because all of this is just one single line of, of text. They've minified it, removed all the white space. But if we right quick, click, we can uh, insert a breakpoint at that position in that one line of string, which is something you couldn't do in IE8 tools. So that's really cool, but it's still ridiculously unreadable. I've got no clue what that stuff does. So if I right click here and say, Format JavaScript. It takes out all the white space minimizing that it's done, but it retains that little uh, breakpoint there in the corner. Even though that breakpoint is still actually on line one, character 55, it means that we can explore the code a little bit easier. Okay. Shoot back over to Bing. Ooh. So we'd like to look at basic HTML sort of hacking, basic JavaScript hacking. Now let's have a look at the CSS stuff. So if I click onto the Bing image here, and as I click on it, any element that I select, will, uh, it will give me their CSS properties in the right-hand side. So if I like Ross scroll down here, I can see all the different styles that have been applied to that property. So for example, I can untick the background image and stop it, stop it working. So I can switch things on and off and see how things work. Or I can change elements as well. So I could say something like, I can whip up to, I don't think this is a 
really clever way of changing your Bing picture, by the way. It's not, I wouldn't advise you to do like that every morning. It would probably take a little bit of time. But what I'm showing, though, is the idea that you can just hack around with these things and play around with them. And it's really good for mocking and prototyping your own sites or discovering how other people have done stuff on their sites. So I'll change the width as well. I'll do it to like 700. Ooh. Oh, excuse me. And I just removed it like to 700. If you take any of those um, CSS things and, and, and we key up or key down as well, it will key up or key down. It's a feature which is also in Firebug. In fact, a lot of the shortcuts which are in the developer tools are also in Firebug. So if you're familiar with Firebug, it kind of, it's kind of nice that, that that's all taken care of for you. Use this technology again. I'll forward over a little bit. So with CSS, we can uh, select the elements, we can switch off rules, we can change rules. If you want to edit the base style sheet, you can now do that. Any changes, again, that you've got, you can save those changes, which is really brilliant, because previously you couldn't. Um, and you can change numerical keys with the up and down arrows. There's lots of shortcuts, and I trust that people which like shortcuts can have a look. I'm not really a shortcut person myself. So the other thing which I really like is the ability to execute JavaScript on any site just by uh, going into the script console. We can even include external libraries if we want. So we could, if we just want to try something and see how something works, we can try that. And I'll just demo that as well. And this time I'll remember to change the screen over. So let's go to Bing Maps this time. And we'll go over to the console. So we can just execute in the console just regular JavaScript. So if I just do good old fashioned alert, How many people use uh, alerting to debug their code? You can be honest, come on. You probably shouldn't. Um, it's probably a good idea to use something like console. So the new INI tools have console as well. You obviously wouldn't write your console stuff in here, but you can include it in your site to debug variables and so forth. But you can execute it because it's just JavaScript executing on the page. And because it's just JavaScript execute on the page, you can go and uh, have a look at some of the stuff which is on that page. So for example, maybe we would be interested in the map. We can go and have a look at the map, and we can see all its properties there quite, quite easily. Or we could call a property. We can even add it to a watch there for the debugging later. Or we could say map dot, oh, actually we'll alert. Oh, God. Uh, what am I doing? Dot get center. I think that's no time to read what the actual debug was. So uh, in Bing Maps, if you don't know, you can just kind of say map dot get center, and you can get the the geo coordinates of that, which is quite cool. But you can do even more stuff than that. So let's just. Uh, get some code that I prepared earlier. And for the English people, that's my blue Peter saying. So we'll go into the, the Zoom console. And this, this piece of code, all it does is uses the uh, new geolocation inside of IE9. And it says, right, well, where am I currently? Where's my position in the world? It gets those positions, and then all I do is I move the current map view to that position. So hopefully, if, uh, if it all worked well, we should be able to run that script. Because we're actually executing in the browser, the, all the security stuff still applies. So it just says, Bing wants to track your physical location. Allow once. So we'll say, yeah, we'll allow it. And what happens is the map then just goes and zooms into where we are. If we currently look on this page, Sorry. Our old friend jQuery isn't on that page. But if we wanted jQuery on that page and we wanted to do some cool stuff with jQuery, but it's not our page, we don't have the source code, how about we just take that, paste some code in, and all that code does is creates a script element, it attaches the, uh, the script and uh, points it to the um, hosted version of jQuery and appends it to the head. 
And now we have jQuery in that page. Oh, no, we don't because I've not run the script. So. Getting me. So jQuery is now there. So I don't know if we took an element or something. What's this? It's an A. So we could say, I suppose, uh, this would be a completely useless exercise. But let's say we wanted to. Uh, sorry, my. Graphic screen's gone a bit funny there. So I just like faded out all of the A tags on that page. Actually, probably a bit rubbish actually, a bit too quick. Fade them back in. So you can execute jQuery, you can bring things in. Um, lots of people which design in browsers use that sort of stuff to try and put stuff directly into their browsers and, and play around, and I love doing that sort of stuff. So next, um, we're gonna have a look at profiling. So one of the big problems when you're looking at a site is trying to figure out what's wrong with it, like how much stuff it's doing, uh, what's slow on my site, how can I improve performance? So we have to include a, a profiler now. We just need to click and start the profiler. Oop. Something quite strange happening on my screen. We'll start the profiler. Right. And we'll zoom out a little bit and zoom in and move around the screen a little. And then we'll stop profiling. And then it shows here all of the different things that just happened on that screen, on that page. Sorry, this is, uh, resolution's pretty poor. Sorry, I don't know why that's gone like that. So if this particular method, if we're interested in knowing more about it, we could just click on it, find out why it's quite slow, find out what it's doing, how we can improve our code there to try and make it more performant. And you can sort by like inclusive time or the count or the number of times it's been ran. And you can just basically pick up the reasons why the problems with it. Or you can have that in a core tree view as well. One of the things that is quite cool about that as well, when you point, when you jump into that piece of code from the profiler, Notice that it's still formatted. Like, that's not really how it is. It's all just one piece, of, one piece of text. It's a really great feature to be able to understand code a little bit more. So, as well as profiling uh, your code, we can also network, uh, check all our network and start capturing stuff. So, I'm gonna do the same here. Uh, again, just running in and out of Bing. And you'll see, as we're doing stuff and it's making requests across the network, it's logging all the different requests that's, that's happening. All 200, luckily enough. As, if there was any 404s in there or images which weren't found, they'd show up there and you could fix those. On the side here, it shows you all the timings, like how long something took. And if we wanted to dig into that particular timing and find out how long it did actually take to execute that one piece, we can find out. So uh, if I go back to the summary view, I'll show that again. So obviously, you're calling lots of different tiles here. So if I click on that tile, it shows me the request that we made to the server. Then it shows what's in that request body, which is nothing, obviously. There's a response which we got back from the server. It tells us things like the, the content type, um, powered by sp.net, the age of the, uh, the response, um, the actual response body, so we can see the image, the actual tire which got passed back on that specific request, any cookies which were passed along, the initializer, uh, initiator sorry, of the request. And that's really useful with CSS, because you know when you have an image and you're not quite sure if it's come from a style sheet or if it's come from JavaScript or if it's come from just HTML, you can actually go through each request and discover that and find that out. So let's just pop over quickly to, you have to just click through a few slides because um, I found that switching between that little thing here and switching back to my machine was causing me so many headaches that I just didn't bother. Um, so we come to this page, this is my website, and this is what it looked like when I just put in WAF format, WAF fonts, uh, in my site. So I was trying to do this new sort of CSS3 thing. I want all my fonts to look really cool and sexy, and I wanted to do it with WAF, web open font format. Now, that the beebs at the top there is pretty plain. That looks to me like it's just HTML. But 
Oh, sorry. It looks just, sorry, it's like it's Arial or something. It doesn't look like it was what I expected it to be, which is this Chunk 5 regular font. And I used font face correctly, and I looked over the syntax, and I was positive that it was correct. But for some reason, my fonts just wouldn't display correctly. So I had a look at the, uh, the profiler. I noticed that there was two uh, 404 errors. So we had, um, and they're both the fonts that I use in that page, those WAF fonts that I use in that page. So I looked at my server and thought, no, I've actually definitely, definitely put them on that page on the server. So then I had a look at the request, and I seen where it was initialized from, made sure that I hadn't missed somewhere, I wasn't overriding it somehow, or it was definitely coming from the CSS page, it was definitely correct, all the stuff was right, it was definitely on my server where I knew it was, so why was I getting a 404 error? Well, it was just simply because I didn't have the, on my actual server, I wasn't able to serve WAF file formats. So every time I was making that request, it was getting a 404. So all I did is go into IAS, add the WAF as a uh, mine type, and then, boom, I've got my, uh, well, I wouldn't say beautiful, but my lovely fonts up there, which are actually how I intended them to be in the first place. Now, as well as those little bits and pieces, there's tons of other things in, in the developer tools. And um, I'll pop a post at the end of this, which shows you a little bit more in, because I've only got 25 minutes to talk about these things. I can't really cover everything. But there's a developer uh, blog, a blog post that I've written, which covers all the things that I've went and talked about today, but in much more detail and showed all the features of our United Developer Tools, because there's a ton of other ones. I'm going to just show you another five, which I really like, and I won't demo them. I'll just quickly run through them for, for time. Obviously, a color picker, it's been there since i8. Um, you can do stuff like, um, sorry, actually, a ruler, sorry. <laughs> That's also been there since IE8. And we can measure different elements. And the, one of the cool things now with the rulers, we can choose to not just measure a particular element, we can change the color of that ruler so it shows up against contrasting backgrounds. We can uh, hide the tick marks, we can hide the endpoints, and we can snap it to elements as well, which was something which you couldn't previously do. We have the color picker there, so we can look at, a, um, look at our logos, the U-Belly logo there, uh, which is a site that we run in the UK. And we can tick that U-Belly logo Pick out the color, and it will tell us what the hexadecimal value of that color is, and also the RGB color as well. We can also validate a lot of our HTML and CSS markup. And there's a ton of different validation engines there. You've got HTML, CSS. Um, one of the things I really like is the accessibility one. Um, both those give you like a, an overview of your entire site and just tell you, you know, how compliant it is with those different standards and those different... Um, those different accessibility guidelines. It's really interesting to see some of that stuff because to be frank, it's not something I really want to go and read a whole book about, but it's something I think is kind of really important. And I'm pretty lazy, so if there's a tool on the internet which is going to help me do that, then I'll use it. The other cool thing which, when I was doing a lot of Windows Phone 7 development, um, was we had this problem where you didn't really want to test your website just in the phone all the time. You maybe just wanted to use it on, the, on, the, on, the, on your desktop. So what I'd often do would be to emulate IE7, because that's the browser which runs on Windows Phone 7. And then I would use the uh, browser resize, then resize it to the size of Windows Phone 7. So you can kind of have a look at how your site performs in those different, different sort of uh, styles. The, uh, I think it's eight, 480 by 800 is the uh, actual resolution of Windows Phone 7. And of course, you can do stuff like disabling, disabling stuff. You can switch off CSS. You can switch off uh, scripts, which is really handy, especially if you want to try and figure out what the problem is with a specific uh, bug that you've got. You can also switch off caching as well, which is really handy. Because when you're trying to cache, uh, when you're trying to investigate something like JavaScript, you, the, one of the biggest problems that you ever find is that you're, you're, you're relying on lots of cached data or cached images and stuff. And you can often miss bugs. So switching off cache when you're debugging is really, really handy. You can also bring back Notepad, which is really quite cool, inside of IE. Because when you currently, in IE, switch and say view source, it comes up with the, uh, the new formatted uh, script sort of notepad -y thing, script viewer. But if you switch back to Notepad, it's like being back in the 90s. It's brilliant. So I'd recommend doing that. So basically, that's a real sort of really quick look at developer tools. As I said, that's the, uh, the link there to the developer tools. It will be live in about 15 minutes with all the slides which are on today and a much more in-depth overview of the developer tools. Please follow me on the Beebs on Twitter because, well, I need the people to follow me because I've got no friends. 
And thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Thank you.